Hello friends, and welcome to another episode of Quandaries and Sundries, where we cover the science and history news of the week, and hopefully expand your knowledge, or at least give you a break from all the craziness of your day-to-day. I hope you all had a great week, and if not, I hope I can help soothe your worry and anxiety, because this week we have some fascinating stories to tell. So sit tight, sit back, and get comfortable. And let us get right into our main story of the week. And then we'll deal with a smaller story towards the end. Antisocial and social. Introvert and extrovert. The very essence that makes up our social interactions. And whether we interact or shy away from situations or confrontation. As much as judging antisocial individuals plays a role in our interactions with our fellow human beings. It is not a primitive trait. Instead, it is more of an evolutionary, or one might say, an adaptive trait that has developed over the last 100 years with our technological advancements and increase in freedoms from different rights movements. I'm not saying people gaining freedoms such as freedom of speech and freedom to have all the rights as their fellow man is bad. I'm saying there is a downside. As anyone who has gone through middle school in the last 20 years as an introverted, antisocial person like me, will tell you there is a hierarchy with alphas and extroverts at the top who push their beliefs on the weak and antisocial. There is nothing wrong with being antisocial or introverted, but this dynamic has allowed bullying in the last few decades to skyrocket because the heart of bullying and cyberbullying is nature's method called natural selection, where the weak are killed off and the strong survive, and our ancestors, as well as Many animals you see on this planet always play out this role of alpha males fighting to win the female so their offspring can be strong and not weak and pass on their DNA to the next generation. It is in our DNA and it is part of us. And as our society advances and our species weeds out the need for natural selection with their advancements in health and social prosperity and widespread use of internet anonymity and freedoms, Our culture is accepting and is going through a revolutionary change not seen before on this planet or with any other species. With the freedoms granted and being granted, with the anonymity the internet gives and the internet spreading of our speech, we may reach a time when it surpasses our need for our ancestral primitive alpha mindset that resides in all of us. And natural selection will choose to be not needed for our evolution. Sadly... I do not think bullying will go away just like that. But when reading a story this week, it makes me question my logic and the role antisocial behavior plays in our natural selection and primitive behavior. Recently, scientists have been observing marmosets. As a species, they are known to travel in groups and prefer group dynamics, moreover alpha dynamics. They enjoy help and cooperation, but how do they pick their groups to mingle amongst? Well, scientists have observed marmosets, watching from a distance, listening to other conversations, and if a marmoset is too antisocial or isolated, it is no value to the group or the cooperative. Which means if one chooses to be antisocial, they will not be able to breed, pass on their DNA, and will be weeded out by natural selection. But what makes an animal antisocial is the question. Ingrained in most animals' DNA is breed the strong and kill off the weak. But nowhere is that process is the time and situations for animals to develop antisocial behavior that would be frowned upon by their fellow species. As humans, it has just become an adaption based on our technological advancements and social growth. This marmoset antisocial evolution must be because of exposure to outside forces or a mutation. But what did it spring from? The marmosets in question were observed in the Brazilian jungles. Even if they observed human tribes in the jungle, they would be at the same social standpoint as the marmosets. Could they observe the cities and human behavior? And is it rubbing off on them? And is it affecting their evolutionary path? Such a leap is not a stretch. If you look at India, many different species of monkeys have learned to live off the streets and learned to steal from humans and interact with them daily. This might mean that animals are learning from us and are adapting their own culture. Many species of animals in the last 100 years have been wiped out 
and are forced to adapt to our cultural impact on the world. As an American, our country has only two animals that come to mind that have adapted to our human footprint. The pigeon and the seagull have learned to follow humans and feed off what we leave behind. And when it comes to the other fauna in this country, they don't interact with humans and adapt to humans in such a drastic way as species of monkeys. That's what makes India, South America, and Africa so special. Because prim primates, the second smartest animals on the planet, second to humans, beings in the next 30 years, I hypothesize, will take great strides in evolutionary and natural selection and adaption that the countries I mentioned will have a front row seat to. As they change and coexist with humans, in certain areas of Africa, monkeys have been observed entering the Stone Age. And I think the marmosets are going through an unnamed age that is way beyond the Stone Age, yet without all the knowledge of the Stone Age. A pseudo-social age through human observation. The real question is, what animal will be next, and if it will have a drastic effect on us as humans? Hearing such stories, like most Americans, my mind automatically jumps to the planet of the apes, but I think that conclusion is highly unlikely, for we will still be far more evolutionary advanced than our fellow primates, but the fact that they are adapting to us gives us a perfect example of our effect on the planet. Another thought comes to mind, and it's that the real test for if another animal is even close to being as intelligent as us will have to be whether they can take command of a lesser species. As humans, we're the only creatures on the planet to breed and control other animals, and if a species starts doing the same thing and becomes number two in the planet's intelligence chain, then I think that will be our time to worry. But I do not see that happening any time in the next millennia. But it is an interesting to think about. It fascinates me to see animals evolving and adapting alongside us, but seriously, when will MTV get on this and give us the desperate house marmosets of Brazil? I know it's dumb, but I would love to see them gossip about one another. Enough of that tangent and on to our next story. Now we move on to our undersea neighbors. And lately when we mention our oceans, one tends to more than not talk about our sea life, whether it be global warming's effect on the underwater biome, on the coral reefs or how plastic is killing fish but there's a threat to our oceans that not many people are talking about that comes from our rapidly developing society i'm talking about noise pollution one of the major problems noise pollution poses to undersea life is how it affects their communication and many life forms in our oceans like dolphins or sharks or whales use sound as their main form of communication Dolphins use their own type of sonar to communicate underwater, called echolocation. And by measuring how long it takes for the sound they make to come back to them, with that information, dolphins can determine how far away objects are from their position. Sharks do something similar. They sense the vibrations from the movement and sounds of objects to tell where their prey is before they strike. And that is why, when being attacked by sharks, it is suggested to not make noise or move too much or they will come after you. Finally, whales who use low frequency sound calls that can travel 10,000 miles to communicate with each other. Since sound travels five times faster in water than sounds we create on the surface, magnifies underwater, disrupting their communication and mating calls. Noise pollution also affects the day-to-day -day life of those whose sounds and vibration help them see where light cannot reach in the ocean. The current record depth of the ocean is a little over 7 miles, and I know that does not seem like much, but it is the height most commercial planes fly at. So next time you are on a flight, look down, and that's the exact depth of the ocean we know of today. However, sunlight only reaches down to about half a mile. The rest is complete pitch black darkness. Most sea life has eyes, but relies on sound to see and our increase in noise pollution is affecting their way of life and making it hard to escape predators and hunt prey. Even though we can transport packages and goods via the air, being able to load your cargo on a boat and ship it by sea is still the most cost-effective form of transportation. And in recent years, various shipping routes have seen a drastic decrease 
and the amount of marine life recorded in the waters surrounding the routes. As our dependence on commercial goods increase, so is the traffic on shipping routes, and which results in the amount of sea life that are staying clear of those routes and changing their migration routes, resulting in fishermen to have to change th their routines and driving fish and other sea creatures deeper, possibly resulting in evolutionary changes over time which might result in the extinction of some life. I would like to take a quick side trip to the surface where scientists have found that the increase in traffic noise over the last few decades has impacted birds' abilities to hunt and hear their prey. Thankfully, noise pollution is the easiest of the climate change problems to fix. Reducing the amount of noise our ships and cars make by switching to cleaner and quieter vehicles, we might be able to reverse this problem. Well, that is all I got for this week. But I will be back next week with an even better episode. I would like to thank you again for joining me for another week. Do not forget to share this podcast to all those in your life who could use a scientific moment in their life. I wish you goodbye, my friends. I hope you will never forget to grow and never stop searching for knowledge. And always trust your scientific nose. I hope you will all join me next week for another episode of Quandries and Sundries. Stay safe, stay sound, stay healthy, always question your logic and reality, do not be afraid to follow the truth, and do not forget to stay informed. This is Van Masterson, signing off.